All right, hello. We are Tri-Nation Capital Partners and we are excited to be here today to set the stage for you all. We are a core plus residential investment fund with a flexible mandate. And we're excited to be here at the year-end performance review and business strategy update. So with that, let's do an introduction of the team. On the investor relations side, you have Yasmin Paserb, myself, Rob Schrader. On portfolio management, you have Brianna Rahan, Alan and Alan Grinberg. And on the acquisitions team, we have Gio Lincoln and Chris Davies. So what are we gonna talk about today? So the first thing we wanted to talk about is the state of the market. As you guys are probably familiar with, there's this little thing called inflation that's going on in the marketplace. We're gonna talk about inflation, corresponding interest rates and the possibility of a moderate recession and how that impacts the real estate fund. From there, we're gonna dovetail into some fund considerations. We're gonna overview our liquidity position, our new capital, uh, capital that we have to deploy and some uh, obligations we have to play on the loan side. Lastly, we're gonna give you three exciting investment opportunities into the single family rental asset class, an asset we're under allocated in and we're long on its uh, fundamental growth and upside. Lastly, we'll give you a quick recommendation and tie that up and bring you all home. So with that said, Yasmin, why don't you uh, give us a quick overview of what's been going on with inflation? So with inflation at historical highs, we would like to analyze the effects on real estate, starting with some key drivers of inflation. First, we have a supply demand imbalance. COVID-19 has caused supply chain issues resulting in, um, and consumer demands resulting in this imbalance. Second, we have a tight labor market. Increasing job vacancy has resulted in uh, driven consumer demands resulting in this uh, tight labor market. Third, we have money supply growth. After a decade of quantitative easing, we now find our economy flushed with cash. As you can see in the chart on the bottom left, this has driven inflation dramatically over the past two years, bringing us to a CPI of 7.7% over the past year. Looking at the graph on the right, we can see that real estate is an inflation hedge and has greatly outperformed other asset classes in high inflation periods. We project that inflation is cooling. However, interest rates will remain high and we can leverage that with real estate uh, via buying opportunities. To understand the effects of interest rates on real estate, it's important to notice the recent and dramatic hikes of rates over the past year. We've seen five rate hikes of 75 bips each, bringing us to the current federal funds rate of 3.75. We project that interest rates will remain high as the Fed will continue curbing inflation rather than focusing on over tightening. The effects on real estate include mainly uncertainty among investors, as well as increases in bid-ask spreads, a distressed market, and potential recession, which Rob will bring us uh, more details on. So we hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we are preparing the fund for a, uh, a moderate recession impact. We don't like to profit um, under bad economic conditions, but we do realize that the uh, possible recession will produce favorable buying opportunities, particularly within the single family rental asset class. So how did we come to that conclusion? There was two scenarios that we evaluated. Scenario one, we expect rates will remain elevated, producing those favorable uh, buying opportunities. Or two, inflation has peaked, at which the Fed will become more accommodative and the lower rates to try to raise growth in the recessionary period. So how did we actually know or why are we predicting a recession? There was two key factors that we monitored. One, we saw that the yield curve has inverted. That means that short-term rates are greater than long-term rates. It's, uh, it's more uncertain to borrow in short term than over the long term. The inversion of the yield curve has been a key in, uh, recession uh, factor of recession, uh, is a key indicator of past U.S. economic recessions. Lastly, the second factor we've noticed is banks' liquidity reserves. We know coming out of the 2008 financial crisis, the banks have more stringent requirements about the amount of cash they have to carry on their balance sheet. And you're already seeing CEOs like J.P. Morgan, as well as in their financials, they're increasing those reserves as they prepare for possible people not being able to make their debts. Taking a step back from the macro perspective, let's look at this on a more individual component. From a cost point, we expect supply chains to remain difficult. Your costs to buy a gallon of milk, your eggs, all the gas that's been putting in your car tank, we expect that to remain elevated. From a real estate perspective, there's two trends we think are important to mention. One is what's known as the denominator effect. So what this means is that your capital allocators, like your pension funds, they have certain mandates of how much of their investment portfolio can be put into real estate. Typically, it's about 10%. Since interest rates have skyrocketed so much, their tech investments valuations have dropped precipitously, meaning that they're overweighted or above their mandate, meaning they either have to sell their assets and, and they likely cannot push more capital into the real estate asset class. 
Fortunately, that's not an issue for us as we have $200 million in LP commitments, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. And lastly, what does this mean for tenants and consumers? It means that we won't have as much discretionary impact capital to spend. You probably won't be able to afford that Disneyland trip, but you will need to have a home. So we're long on single family rental and the fact that people need places to live. So with that, I'll tee it over to uh, Brianna to talk about the funds consideration and where we stand from a cash perspective. Thanks, Rob. We wanted to provide you with an update on where we are currently and where we're headed. Our focus is residential, primarily high-rise apartments, student housing, and garden-style apartments. Um, we are, uh, our fund is an evergreen fund that is, has $2.2 billion in gross asset value and $1.2 billion in net asset value. We are in a favorable liquidity and leverage position as we enter into this period of uncertainty. As you can see on the bottom left-hand side of the chart, uh, on an unlevered basis, we are currently underperforming our apartment MPI index. And that's because of the over allocation in high rise coastal apartments. In order to increase our returns, we are focusing on shifting our efforts to investing in SFR. Uh, we currently are exposed to about 4% and we would like uh, our target is about 10%. Now let's take a look at where we are headed. Uh, we, about, we have about four new LP commitments totaling $200 million. And we also have uh, $120 million in loan maturities in 2023. After taking to into effect our 5% liquidity reserve requirement, we're at $95 million in deployable cash. Our portfolio is uh, allocated among six different sectors. As a result of market disruption, we're expecting a 5 to 15% decline in GAV. Uh, we took a look at public REITs in order to determine the GAV per sector. On average, the GAV decline is about 7%, which is a lot better than what we're seeing in the market for property types such as office. Uh, what we learned in the pandemic is that um, people are still paying their rent, their rent obligations. People still need a home. So no matter uh, if it's a tough time or not, it's uh, people still need a place to live. And, and that's why we're feeling good about our strategy, focusing on residential. So moving forward in this period of uncertainty and with an impending recession, uh, we think that this is an opportune time to increase our SFR investment. And Alan will further explain why. Thank you, Brianna. Okay, so let me explain you why we're in front of a great opportunity to invest in single family rent. First, home prices are 50% higher than three years ago. Pair that with mortgage rates at 7%, none of us on this stage will be able to afford a house anytime soon. Also, with work from home trends, we've seen consumers demand more outdoor spaces and more space in general. On the other side, we've seen that housing supply has not kept up with demand mainly because developers are incentivized to build luxury homes and not start their homes. As a result of the high demand and low supply, we've seen rents at record highs and we're also seeing a lot of uh, increased interest from institutional capital to the single, single family rental market. It is a huge market. There are 15 million SFR units, which is very similar in size compared to the traditional multifamily market. While these are all strengths and opportunities, there are also some weaknesses and threats that we should consider. The most important one is that it is very difficult to scale in the single family rental market, and it is very difficult to manage the properties. If you compare it with a traditional multifamily market, in which with one deal, you get hundreds of units that are all in one location, which makes it easier and cheaper to manage. In SFR, you need to source a lot of deals, you need to do a lot of transactions, and, it, and it, you need to manage properties in multiple locations. To mitigate this, we believe that the best is to partner with an experienced sponsor that has the capabilities to source the deals, bring us good investment opportunities, and manage our properties. That partner can be Sidewalk Advisor. Sidewalk is a real estate company that operates with an OPCO proper structure. This means that they have a traditional real estate investment company which invests in real estate SFR assets, but they also have an operating company the, that manages these, their investments and also third party properties. You have three main options to invest with them. The first one is to invest in their operating company, their property management company. It can be with either common equity or preferred equity. The second option that we have is to co-invest with them in real estate assets, SFR units via special purpose vehicles along their property company. And the third option that we have is to invest in both 
their operating company and in real real estate assets. Now, Gio and Chris will walk us through the details of these three investment opportunities. Thank you, Alan. The opportunity cost for our fund has never been higher. As portfolio management just described, it is imperative that we increase our allocation to the SFR asset class. And fortunately, we are in a cash position to capitalize on this very moment. Before diving into the details of the three investment options, I wanna take a minute to talk about the opto propto structure and describe why this is such an interesting opportunity for our fund. We'll start at the bottom of the slide and follow the money upward to understand the relationship between the two entities. The PropCo is the entity that holds the SFR assets. You can think of this as a traditional real estate company that generates revenues from rental income. This differs from the OPCO that generates all of its revenues from property management, repairs, and maintenance of the underlying assets. Simply put, more assets at the PropCo level lead to more revenues at the OPCO level. Now that we understand the structure a little more, let's dive into the three investment opportunities. Starting with option one, should we invest in the OPCO? For context, OPCO currently generates $8 million of revenue from the 3,200 units that it manages. Since inception, it's grown its revenue year over year by 100% and is projected to continue growing at a rapid pace. Our fund has the opportunity to invest $20 million out of the 95 available into the OPCO in order to fund expansion into new markets and improve the OPCO's technological capabilities, which would improve its property management, as well as increase the ability to source better deals in the SFR market. Our fund has a 10% cap of NAV to invest in real estate operating companies. Currently, we have no exposure to the space. However, this investment would represent about 2% of our NAV, which is well within the cap. A few key considerations and assumptions that we should talk about with investing in the OPCO are expense inflation, revenue growth assumption, and the exit multiple. Our investor relations team has outlined macroeconomic headwinds that would impact the OPCO's ability to manage its properties. With labor shortages and increased material costs, it would be more expensive for the OPCO to manage its properties. We've accounted for this in our underwriting as well as built some cushion in there for this headwind. On the top right hand side of the slide, you'll see that we've sensitized the revenue growth assumption as well as the exit multiple. During our due diligence period, we found that companies of similar size and scale tend to exit anywhere from a five times to a 10 times EBITDA multiple. We believe that we, for, just to be conservative, we've underwritten these returns at a five times EBITDA multiple, producing a 37 uh, levered IRR as well as a three and a half equity multiple. The next consideration if we decide to move forward with the OPCO is to decide whether we invest in common equity or preferred equity. Preferred equity is higher up on the capital stack. However, the majority of these returns are driven upon sale. And therefore, we believe that the common equity actually provides a more favorable risk return profile. To summarize, this deal is good from a quantitative perspective as it provides outside returns for our investors and the qualitative benefits of investing in the OPCO would be to establish a long-term partnership with a proven operator in the space, as well as diversifying our investment in the SFR space by investing in an operating company rather than traditional assets. We like option one, however, before providing a final recommendation, I'll pass it off to Chris to walk us through the other two options. Let's get started by saying how excited I am seeing you to walk you through options two and three, because we believe as a team that they align great with our business plan. As we were analyzing option one, we saw Sidewalk as a great partner. They were boots on the ground, and they have had more than 15 years of experience in the space that we wanted to grow, the SFR. So we proposed to partner up through co-investments through their SDVs or single purpose vehicles to purchase and operate our single family, single family rental unit. They've been doing this obviously with other partners and that was a great idea for us. So what we did, we thought about financing this through, with the $75 million of capital we had left after investing or allocating 20 million to option one because we like it. Pair that up with a 50% with a loan to value or equal amount of, of debt and, and equity because we believe that through our great relationship with banks and other institutions, we can get interesting debt rate, uh, interest rates given the current market conditions, around 6%. Maybe even better if we can you know, deal, deal to deal. Now, I'll walk you through a few of those numbers. 
that gives us $150 million of purchase power to, to execute this deal. Plugging this into our underwriting model, we get a levered IRR of just below 12%, cash on cash of 5% or above, which really aligns with our core fund strategy, an exit upon multiple of 1.47x, and uh, an entry cap rate of 5.7, which we plan to compress to 110 basis points to exit at 4.6 by bundling up and probably selling to an institutional investor. At this point, we knew that levered IRR had to be adjusted for a few facts, mainly, we still know that we had a few flanks open on the debt side, we needed to secure that debt. But something that's more manageable was that the fact that we partnered up with a, a great invest, a great partner doesn't really assure us that we'll get these executed deals in the future. So as we sat down with them and, and expressed this, they, uh, in, a, in a sign of good faith, approached us with a counter deal. They said that we invested in option one, if you invest in option one, sorry, they would sweeten the deal for option two, by two, two ways. First, they would re reduce our property management fees and our promote fees to below market level. And best part, they would give us access, they would give us right of first offer for the next $100 million in deployed equity for the next two years. That means the pick of the litter for every deal they sourced over the next two years. This brings us to option three. Option three, what you see on the screen is just the underwriting of the PropCo but it does include invest, investing in the OPCO, but those numbers don't change. What we assume here are the same key metrics that we did for, a pro, for our operation for option two, but we changed the property management fees and the promote fees. As you can see on the upper right co left corner, that increases our basis our levered IRR by 60 basis points in a conservative scenario. Conservative because we're not including any inflation or rent hikes. So we feel very comfortable with this number. <clears throat> At this point, you're probably thinking, why would we invest all of our deployable cash into one single partner. Well, I can tell that if we do that, it means that they brought us all the best deals. We ran them through the investment committee and they all got approved. So I think it's actually a good thing. Now, our risk, our, the main risk that we see as a team is actually to, it would be a mistake to not enter this space because we already missed the, the, the SFR vote for three years and we think it's time to do it. It all actually boils down to the fact that we believe that this partnership will bring us the best deals over the next three years. Now, having said that, pass it on to Ron. Rob, sorry, so he can wrap it up with recommendations. Thank you, guys. So here's the recommendation, a summary of all the investment options we propose to you today. You got the Opco with the common equity, the Propco with the lower property management and promote fees, as well as an additional value add savings we would generate. We're forecasting this as about $200,000 for moving our annually, for moving our existing 208 SFR units over to the new Opco to manage them with the lower below market fees. So um, after doing that, you're looking at an IRR that's just under 21%, an equity multiple of 2x. We have a sources and uses table that actually shows you how we're going to pay off all of our debts that's coming, as well as our investments, while maintaining our liquidity reserve in case redemptions start calling. After that, this is what our entire fund looks like. Um, Post-investment, post-write-downs that we made to our existing portfolio, and uh, post uh, $200 million in LP commitments. So the first thing you might notice is that we're about uh, just under 1% increased in GAV. Most of that is probably given by the $200 million in LP commitments that we recently received. The last thing I'd like to point out is our SFR holdings tab here. We're at 208 units. We're looking to over triple that to 753. So that really accomplished our goal of what we were seeking out to do. So in conclusion, there's three things that we really want you to keep track of. One, it's a tough market out there. It's really hard to transact in the marketplace given the way that interest rates are moving and the cost of financing. We also believe that uh, recession is likely on the way and this is gonna produce great buying opportunities. La second thing is where are we as a fund? As a fund, we've been underperforming because we've been un under allocated in SFR and because we're over allocated in coastal markets, SFR tends to concentrate in tertiary and secondary markets where there's high population growth and demand. So we have $200 million in LP commitments that's coming in a lot better than our peers. What are we going to do with it? We're going to partner with a real uh, asset with 15, or a partner with 15 years of experience that's going to be able to drive the returns at a sector we're under allocated in. They're going to give us a huge right of first offer opportunity that's going to give us the chance to get the best deals that work for us, not just because we have to take them or compete with our competitors on price. So with that, we'll open the floor to any questions.
Yeah, so the 37% levered IRR would be upon exit in five years. Currently, it's a startup company that doesn't uh, generate any um, profits. And so the way we did that was to look at what's trading sort of in the market and where our peers sort of exited. And that's uh, on the conservative end of what we felt we could return. However, if they were able to continue to exit at a higher multiple, I think the 37% the is, is honestly on the low end, but we just wanted to be conservative uh, in order to bring the this approach to investment. Uh, so, the conservative approach there was not including any rent hikes or inflation in the model, and that still yielded 110 percent basis point, uh, 110 sorry basis point of compression. Uh, if we were to include uh, uh, sorry inflation and rent hikes, that would that would reach almost 4.9 or almost five included. We believe that other other strategies have worked before for other companies where they bundle up. Uh, uh, Asset that's hard to get, and then sell it to a, a bigger portfolio like a pension fund, and it and they they're willing to pay more for that. So using those two considerations into account, we believe that it's a conservative approach. 